Today, adventures challenge China's Yangtze River. A Sino-American team attempts a perilous journey on rafts and kayaks. It's the last great river adventure on Earth. But it's a human adventure as well, bringing the team into contact with the hidden cultures of China's interior, people never before seen by Westerners. Chinese teams are also competing for the honor of the first descent of the mighty Yangtze. The pride of all China is on the line today. Mutual of Omaha's Spirit of Adventure is brought to you by the Mutual of Omaha family of companies. People you can count on for insurance and financial services for all ages. And by Quaker State Motor Oil. Quaker State people reaching for the best. This is the mark of the Mutual of Omaha family of companies. ...at an altitude of 17,600 feet amidst an immense wilderness of rock and ice. For most of the year, everything here is frozen. But in the annual thaw, the glaciers, 40,000 miles of them, begin to drip and melt. Each one issues forth a vast network of streams. The ice seracs, some of them as big as houses, are the frozen rivers of Asia waiting to be born, anxious for the warmth of summer. The locals call it the river going through the heavens. But further down, it becomes one of the fiercest and deepest rivers in the world. After seven years of negotiations and planning with the Chinese, rafting company owner Ken Warren, a 59-year-old grandfather, along with his wife Jan, were given the sought-after permission to attempt this last great river exploration. China's national pride was on the line. Two Chinese teams were already on the river when the Americans arrived. The Chinese hoped to claim the feat for their own country. One was a scientific expedition. The other consisted of eight young men, all under the age of 35, who were inspired to make this challenge. Hi, I'm Jim Fowler. Here at Wuhan, China, still a thousand miles from the sea, the mighty Yangtze provides a mile-wide highway for commerce. But our story begins at the source of the river itself. It's an adventure that spans two continents, with explorers from two nations challenging what has never before been conquered. Bob Beatty reports from the source. Well, it's quite a sight, isn't it? We're near the source of the Yangtze River at an altitude of about 14,500 feet. Actually, the source of the river is at an altitude of almost 18,000 feet. And to get there, the there, 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 expedition flew to the city of the city of the They repacked nine tons of gear and headed overland toward base camp. The challenge that lay ahead was nothing less than epic. The Yangtze flows for nearly 4,000 miles across China. Warren's goal was to go by raft and kayak from the source down to the city of Yibin, covering some 2,000 miles of wild, uncharted river over a period of 60 days. When we first started talking about uh, this expedition, I knew the logistics of just getting here were going to be the toughest part of the trip. I'm not negating the river at all. It's going to be an extremely difficult river. I think sections of it are going to prove to be the most difficult white water in the world. But this is just extremely difficult logistics, uh, no matter how you look at it. And, I particularly admire the Chinese. Uh, how they've got us here has just been incredible. Ken's wife, Jen, was leader of the road support crew. Take four. Four people. Four. Four men. Four. That's it. Very early on, altitude was a consideration. Well, sure, there's concern. There has to be. Because nobody's ever started that high that we know of. And, uh... What, uh, what the effect is going to be on us trying to, you know, we're going to be in the smaller boats, of course. Uh, what the effect is going to be, uh, we don't know. But I got a real strong feeling that, like, I feel so much better today. I'm sure you feel the same way. We're getting acclimatized, and that's the key. We're still, like, three or four days away, 
actually six days away from getting to the source and maybe seven days away from putting on. But I think by that time we're going to be in real good shape. As the team climbed higher, they traded in their trucks for horses and yaks. The yaks carried about 80 pounds apiece. They are the traditional beast of burden in the Himalayan mountains. Tibetan guides led the way through the increasingly rugged terrain, showing their visitors a part of the world rarely seen by Westerners. The team of river rafters continued on toward their meeting place with the source, a place no American has visited before. When they arrived, no one was more deeply moved than the leader himself. Oh, beautiful lady of the Yangtze, we thank you for allowing us to be here. Especially to be here at your birthplace. Such an incredibly beautiful place. We ask that you take care of us. And so it began, using inflatable kayaks because the river was too narrow for rafts, as Jan Warren registered a first in women's sports. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into, but uh, I was there and I was committed. And uh, personally within myself, I was apprehensive when we were going to get in the boats and just shoot down that first set of rapids. They had told us the big boulder was around the corner and there was going to be sharp turn. And uh, I was anxious, but ready. When the dream of the Yangtze uh, was first conceived, uh, I felt that if I could, in fact, reach the source of this mighty river at close to 18,000 feet, um, my dream would be realized. The Yangtze was constantly absorbing other glacial runoffs, greedy for its own increase. The rushing streams contributed great volumes of water and added velocity to the burgeoning flow. In all, the team covered 200 miles in their historic journey from the source back to base camp, dropping almost 3,000 feet in elevation. They had come halfway around the world, only to find there was yet another world waiting to be explored. It was the world of their own expectations. The boats were amazing. And we got lower down. Uh, we ran into this, a lot of what you see out uh, front here, an incredible maze, branches going off everywhere. Uh, we'd pick up canyons where the water would be one channel for uh, maybe 15, 20 miles, but then we get back into this maze and just have to pick our way through. Most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. It's easily the most difficult thing I've ever done, ever, in my entire life. Tibetans were a reminder of the human adventure of the river, a river that linked peoples from vastly different origins. We wish to thank all of you, People's Republic of China, and all of you people for allowing us the privilege of being on your river. Thank you very much. <laughs> Katas, or links of white silk, were presented as a traditional greeting and a symbol of good luck during the welcome ceremony. It had been hoped that the Chinese would provide a helicopter for additional support, but this was not possible. As the river team set off on the second leg, the town of Todahoyan gave them a festive goodbye. Well wishers lined the riverbanks. Chinese firecrackers echoed across the river. It could have been a day long ago on the Mississippi or the Colorado, but it was the Yangtze at its very best, where the river formed a bond between the Tibetans and the members of the Sino-American team. Before he set off, I asked Ken, why the Yangtze? Well, it's pretty easy. It's the last great fun run river left in the world. There's nothing like it. From Torohoyan to Yushu would be our longest uh, time apart. 
from the river team. And it was a part that we were concerned about, not for the white water, but just the difficulty of going 500 river miles. We wouldn't see them again for about two weeks. After the Amazon and the Nile, the Yangtze is the world's third largest river. Yet it is the river about which least is known. No words of advice from veterans of the source, just open space, silence, and beauty. Three Chinese oarsmen had been part of the team for more than a year before the expedition formally began in July 1986. They had trained with Ken Warren in Oregon. Chu Si Ming had been anticipating such an expedition since he was a boy. I spoke to him at base camp. Well, I've heard about it long before I went to the uh, Oregon last year. And when I was there, uh, we went down eight different rivers, and that uh, gave us some real taste of whitewater, and I feel like I really like it. And now we're here, and uh, I'm really glad I'm one of the worst men here. <laughs> I think it's going to be great for everyone. Chu Ju Zhang and Zhang Ji Yu rounded out the Chinese contingent, proof of the vital cooperation between China and the U.S. Oregon's Ron Matson was second oar to Ken Warren. Jack of all trades. I mean, I do everything. I'm, uh, my, I guess my primary function is an oarsman on the river. And then in addition to that, I'm the welder, fix-it man, uh, cook, photographer. Bill Atwood commanded another of the seven rafts, while 24-year-old Toby Sprinkle was one of the youngest oarsmen to win a position on the river. Gary Peoples was a backup oarsman. Oh, we are really moving now. More than a hundred years ago, members of the Lewis and Clark expedition did much the same thing as the Yangtze River team. They stopped, looked, and tried to figure out just where they were in a wilderness as yet unexplored by man. During a lunch break on the second day, Ken Warren discussed the river and the ominous skies with oarsman Ansel Nance. Speed, this is the way I think the river... Uh, would be most of the way down. Yeah. And the storm is coming directly at us. I notice we're heading due east again. Yeah. That's good news. That's for darn sure. We'd have four seasons in an hour. We'd have monsoon rains, just flat out blizzards. We'd have hail and sleet flurries. We'd have dust storms. On the third day out of base camp, temperatures plummeted and a big storm moved in. When the blizzard hit, the boats were widely separated, uh, a couple of them almost out of sight, so I got on the radio and, and uh, called uh, with a great amount of urgency for the boats to close up uh, as tight as possible. We had to get within sight of each other and distance. Visibility was only about 50 feet in any direction. Ken repeatedly called a Chu to head toward shore. Finally, he heard the radio over the wind and got in safely. Photographer David Shippey had become sick earlier in the trip upon arrival at base camp at an altitude of nearly 15,000 feet. He was sent down to a lower altitude and then, feeling better, rejoined the expedition. Now, further down the river, he became ill again. Team doctor David Gray spent the night monitoring Shippey's condition. As the team set off, all thoughts were on David Shippey. The plan was to get him down from altitude as quickly as possible, but that wasn't going to be easy. As far as the eye could see, there was just open country and certainly no human habitation. The purpose of the IV was twofold. One, to provide hydration, and two, to provide a route for the administration of medications for controlling the fluid buildup in Dave's lungs. Shippy's condition worsened as the day went on. His lungs were unable to benefit from the medication.
David Shippey, 28 years old, died shortly before midnight. The next day, overcome with shock and grief, the team prepared for his burial along the banks of the Yangtze. An oar blade was carved in English on one side and Chinese on the other. It gave the name and dates of the life that was David Shippey's. All right, let's just start off. We're gathered here on the morning of August 4th, 1986, to honor David Shippey, who was a member of our expedition team, uh, as a still photographer. Unfortunately, uh, he died of high altitude sickness, as best our doctor can ascertain. Very, very fast. In the period of the last two days, you've seen what can happen to another human being. Let's go ahead and lay him to rest. Our Heavenly Father, I know Dave is in the best place he could possibly be. May his soul guide us safely down the river. And may our success be to his memory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. I think Ron put it very well in the statement that Dave was a dreamer. And uh, I have a quote on my wall from Teddy Roosevelt. It basically says that he always pitied those poor timid souls who never dared and Dave obviously dared especially I think with his own knowledge of his physical condition and uh, that's extremely unfortunate but I guess that's uh, the price uh, that was paid he is resting in a very very beautiful place and uh, I hope that everyone back home agrees that we've left a very fitting memorial to him. Beneath the flag of China, five small American flags were placed on the oar, representing the five days the shippy had spent on the river. It was a loss that couldn't really be absorbed or understood by the team. David's humor and sparkhead fled this earth. This would mark a turning point in the expedition. Dr. Gray believed that David's death was caused by pulmonary edema. Recently, we spoke with Dr. Peter Hackett, himself a mountaineer and recognized as the leading expert on sickness at altitude. Young, healthy, vigorous people who go up to sleep at altitudes over 10,000 feet can develop this problem where the lungs fill up with fluid. And of course, when the air sacs fill up with fluid, they can't exchange air person gets very low oxygen level and they can die. It's not to say that uh, nobody should go to high altitude, it's just that at altitude uh, one has to assume a reasonable rate of ascent. Despite a reasonable rate of ascent, one out of a hundred people might get some difficulty. So you can't really hold up a whole group of people in hopes that nobody will develop pulmonary edema. Uh, you, you go at a reasonable rate and try to pick out the problem early enough so that you can do something about it. And so it has to be considered an objective danger, just like avalanches might be considered an objective danger to a mountaineer, or a rough river might be considered to have objectively dangerous uh, rapids for a boatman. Come on, Jake. The oarsman, Ron Matson. It seemed like a tough thing to shake. Uh, people were real quiet for a number of days, uh, sitting in groups of one or two. I don't know if one's a group, but we'd be sitting by ourselves, talking to ourselves occasionally. Um, just talking about the trip, or talking about the events, and trying to trying to realize, trying to understand when it would be appropriate again to um, to just go on. And I mean, it's a trip, and I mean, we can start joking. Um, you know, trying to figure out when it was appropriate to put Dave's death behind us. The unexpected presence of Tibetan prayer flags and stones gave the team a small lift. The prayer stones were the welcoming sign of a small village above the river a village that seemed lost in another century. I saw the beautiful waterfall coming off the left-hand bank, and, and uh, my feelings ran very high that here, after some 600 miles, was our first real, true, fresh water. After learning that the village was completely isolated without phone or electricity, the team got back onto the river. 
At this point, the Yangtze was joined by a network of tributaries, each one a major flow unto itself. With this kind of feed-in system, it's little wonder that the Yangtze is 20 times bigger than China's second biggest river. Well, you know, it's really neat when you're running down the river and you come around the corner and you look up and you see the villages and all of a sudden you see all these people just come running down the hill and it really makes you feel important. I really like those kids, you know, little kids running down all the way from their village. Their village used, used to be literally to be very high on the hill. They, they're running down and uh, they run along with us. The people I thought would be uh, all nomadic. I found out that the people, it gradually changes from the plains down to the canyon areas where most of the Tibetans down here are actually agricultural, where the people up on the plains are more shepherds. Although the village had no regular contact with the outside, there was plenty of commerce. Herdsmen were selling wool to the merchants who periodically visit the area. The Tibetan herdsmen are semi-nomadic, coming into town only to trade for supplies or sell off part of their stock. When we came here, the first thing we want to know is, like, uh, where are you from, or if you are Chinese? Because uh, we see so many uh, different people on our boats, especially, you know, you guys with beard and everything, uh, blonde hair. And I think uh, you are the first uh, foreigners to come down here, the first time to see it. So we want to know who the, you know, the hell these guys are. Oh, some of these villages were uh, too high for me. I, I'm just thinking about carrying water and food, fuel, and all that. Of course, I suppose but what happens is people just sort of uh, get their roll down and they just do it. It's part of life. They probably don't know anything like sidewalks and wheels. Still two or three days from Yushu, the team discovered that their food supplies were dangerously low. They cut down to two meals a day and agreed to adopt the oldest rule in dieting, no eating in between meals. After lunch, Ken and Chu hiked out to look for a phone. There's a telephone up there. They said his brother's there, but ask how long it takes or how far it is. He didn't say anything. Yeah. It seems uh, he didn't understand or he's too could concerned be. about his yaks. Could be half mile or it could be 10 miles. We don't know. We don't know. OK, well, then let's just get back and get down river. The first white water on the trip took everyone by surprise. Despite the drop in gradient in altitude, which suggested that the Yangtze might get rough at this point, the flow remained manageable. But clearly, the swelling tributaries and tight canyons were hints of rapids yet to come. Here, the oarsmen felt the first pull of the river, the first tug of its growing power. After 700 road miles, Jan Warren and her crew were nearing Yushu. They had no way of knowing of the river team's tragedy. In a sense, Jan was on a totally different expedition, following the bumpy dirt roads that crossed the Yangtze so infrequently. The road team is scheduled to cover 3,600 miles overland just to resupply the rafts at three locations up to the halfway point at Bataan. At Yushu, Jan prepared to resupply the team with food, fuel, and water. Without radio communication, she could do little more than wait and watch the river for signs of the team. Understandably, she had begun to worry about her husband and the others. Meanwhile, the river team was virtually out of food. Ken decided to hike out, find some herdsmen, and try to buy a sheep. He took the Chinese team members with him to negotiate, but they faced a language barrier of their own. 
Though Tibet is administered by China, the Tibetans have preserved their own language and culture. In the end, a price was agreed on. The expedition team was going to have food once again. <laughs> the Tibetans were eager to see the team's rafts and equipment while the sheep was being brought in from the field. Tibetan children were introduced to one or two American pastimes. It was a nice way to forget just for a moment the terrible news that the team had yet to tell the world. The Tibetans had something in store as well. Ken Warren volunteered to try his hand at riding a yak, and he didn't break any records. Over the head or here, like that? Yeah, huh? Not over the head. Not over the head? Mm. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. All right, the flower. Oh, Step up cleanly. <laughs> that night, the crew had meat for the first time in almost two weeks. A meal that lifted their spirits for the difficult days ahead. The group, as still photographer Barbara Reese, shared in her growing concern for the rafters. They were now well overdue in Yushu. The team was out there all right, in fact, too far out to receive the signal. Jan and Barbara decided to visit the water station outside Yushu, which monitors the river level for the town's hydroelectric plant. Through an interpreter, they learned that the river had been much higher when one of the Chinese teams passed by earlier. Have you seen any of the river rafters uh, come, come before us? Ten people. Mm -hmm. Loyang has have eight. Uh, what was the water flow when the Sichuan team came through? The Sichuan team came through. 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 The Sichuan through. The Sichuan team came through. The Sichuan team came through. The Sichuan team came through. On the river, the team found it hard to pinpoint their exact location. This part of the Yangtze has simply not been mapped. They were late by two days. We went up the road on two different uh, days to scout for them. We were just sure they were going to come in. You copy. Over. There's a big... Uh... The team's maps were the best available, but that didn't prove to be much of a help. There were big blank spaces marked unknown. Let's see, we are just right here. Let's figure how many K we got on that. What would you say? Left for today. Yeah. Not much. If I were here, we were in an area that was beyond any current maps. Finally, after 13 days on the river, they reached Yushu. It turned out to be a, a quite anxious time for all of us as we were sitting there waiting for him. And when they came in, we saw them. We had put a sign up river about a mile. We were so excited, and I was so thrilled uh, to see the, the, the team come in. It was just unbelievable how I felt at that time. Uh, 
Although this reunion was meant to be a happy one, it brought back the tragedy of David Shippey and the need to get word to his family and friends. It was Ken who spoke first, breaking the news to Jan. But Jan had bad news, too. She had learned that three rafters had drowned on one of the Chinese expeditions further down the river. In, in China, there had been missing rafters on the Sichuan team, and uh, they were going to be going into the next section. So it was going to be a time for me to uh, give them some bad news that had been going on. For the Sino-US team, this news heightened the fear of what might lie ahead. With a death behind them and reported deaths ahead of them, with the problems of food shortage not yet resolved and with increasing controversy over Ken Warren's leadership, the team members called a meeting at Yushu. Uh, we've been uh, discussing the expedition up to this point and where we feel some of the big problems are, and especially we all came on this trip knowing that there was a possibility that somebody could die. And the thing with, with Shippey, we've got the doctor's assurance, it's just unavoidable. And we're very concerned the way the trip's been done up to this stage. Uh, that's it in a nutshell. We feel we're at a turning point and it's something very, very drastically different has to be done. Um, we know that you've put an incredible amount of time and effort and money into doing this trip, that this trip is everything to you right now, and to a man, we want to see the trip succeed. I've been pushing to keep the trip going. There's some pretty hard opinions that the trip won't continue, and I'm, I'm just saying a piece just because Ron is not our spokesman. We you, have... you voted in that, too, you and the boys? It's like, uh, like people said, it's a turning point, and we're not sure because we have concern about the safety. Uh, can something happen? You know, it's, uh, we All right, right. Let's, uh, we have to talk. I think I'll so sit down and talk about that, and we'll make a decision on the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, because okay. I told everybody I can't make a decision because this is the government and all right. the things. It's, a, it's our right. agreement. At the Danka Monastery in Yushu, the team was treated to a special ceremony, one that the monks had been preparing for the Panchen Lama, who was going to visit in a few weeks. Panchen Lama is currently the highest ranking Lama in the country. The ceremony was beautiful, but the rafters were preoccupied with thoughts of the trip and what was ahead. Stretch of the river. It's been a very 
important rest period for us of three days. I feel our energies are now renewed and we're ready to proceed to success on the Yangtze. Ken Warren's pep talk was a little late for some. Four of the team members, including Dr. David Gray, had decided it was unsafe to go on. They headed for home. That left the expedition without a doctor. Perhaps sensing that there had been problems, the Tibetans presented the expedition with an emblem. Later, a dance was performed in the team's honor. It was also decided that two rafts should be pulled off the river. So once again, the team set out, drawn back to the river, which even after the sacrifice it had asked of them, was still the place of their dreams. The Warrens, too, separated again. But this leg would be a much shorter one, to populated areas with access to communication. The team planned to consume four days in their 250-mile trip down to Dege, the next resupply point. Kayaker Paul Sharp joined the team at Yushu and took on the duties of scouting ahead of the rafts for big water. His maneuverability would be a great help. Despite the divided attitudes about the trip, the leg below Yushu represented a new beginning for the team. Ansel Nance expressed his conviction to go on. I knew in my head that uh, I wasn't going to be one of the guys standing on the shore watching the boats go downriver around the bend. I was going to be on those boats because that was the most important thing to me, going down the Yangtze River. The Yangtze soon presented different characteristics. It was wider, stronger, and more deeply cut into the rock. It was not uncommon to see prayers etched into the rock walls, made sheer by centuries of passing water. Here, the Yangtze was usefully exploited by loggers who crossed it by making a raft out of the wood they would sell on the other side. On the first day out of Yushu, the rafters encountered big water. We're going on uh, minus the four uh, uh, team members, but the spirit and the mood is very good. Despite the fact that everyone is well aware that we're going into an area where the all Chinese team ahead of us have aborted their expedition. After setting camp, a scouting party hiked ahead to look at the flow. They realized very quickly that the party was over. From here on out, it was going to be all that everyone said it might be. Tough, unpredictable, and possibly untamable. But that's what they had come for.
the Chinese members said it was their first experience on water with this kind of power. The Yangtze runs up to 40,000 cubic feet of water per second. And when it gets going, it's a train without any stops. Sharp had his share of problems too, as the strong undercurrents took his wind and strength away. But Paul is a veteran of big water all over the world. He came through just fine. Thus far, the team has covered over 550 miles of uncharted river, from the source to a camp 50 miles below Yushu. They have dropped over 5,000 feet in elevation, but the biggest water is yet to come. This is Jim Fowler. Next Sunday, the conclusion of this once-in-a-lifetime journey as the teams head into the jaws of the powerful Yangtze. The Sino-American team continues its pioneering effort in the midst of China's vast interior. New rafting configurations are used to help the team make it through the awesome hydraulics of a river gone out of control. In this kind of water, the exposure for kayaker Paul Sharp grows even more perilous. We'll continue to follow the Chinese teams as well. Both groups united in their quest for this last great prize in river running. The claim to be the first down the mighty Yangtze. That's next Sunday on Mutual of Omaha Spirit of Adventure.